Today it is my sincere pleasure to welcome John Veal to come and speak with us. Rooted on the west side of Chicago, John Veal has forged a transdisciplinary practice that utilizes installation, writing, painting, drawing, and performance. John has exhibited at Chicago Artist Department, Silent Funny, William Hill, Homewood Science Center, Chicago Cultural Bowl, and the Terrain Biennial. He's currently in artist in residence at Compound Yellow and has an exhibit at the Oak Park Library. I hope I got that correct. And lots of other things. Uh, feel free to look him up. Um, John is also the co-founder and director of ALT, which is an artist-led nonprofit based in Chicago that is dedicated to revitalizing communities through art and culture and providing an alternative to the narrative. ALT was incepted in response to the trauma of their communities and the belief that art could be used as a tool for revolution. I first met John at a fieldwork residency in 2018 that we were both participating in, which was built around building our professional practices and visioning. Um, and so I got a lot of time with John. We got to hang out quite a bit. Um, and also to talk about what we were really inspired by and what we wanted to do with our artistic lives. Uh, and I was so struck by how ambitious John was for the things that he wanted to do. Um, and oftentimes I remember being like, mm, that may take longer than you think. And in fact, he's done most of the things that he visioned three years ago um, in this very short amount of time. So I am cr truly inspired by him. Um, and also he has been um, working with our 3D class. Um, he did a workshop a month ago and he's gonna do a, a workshop today as well, where we are talking through ideas about design and how that plays into how it affects our communities. And I think he is a really great example of how art really can play an important role in our lives, our everyday lives in a really significant way. So I am very excited to have John come and speak to us. Um, if you could help me welcome John Veal. Okay, cool. So it's early in the morning, and as I was just telling my new friends over there, um, I haven't had enough coffee. So yeah, you, you feel me? You know what I'm saying? And so rather than like run out of here to the nearest Starbucks, I'm wondering if we could like do some stuff. And so some of you guys got phones in your hands, some of you guys got notebooks or whatever. Put those down for a second. Let's, let's, let's start differently. Cool, cool, cool. This is a very intimate kind of setting right here. So I'm gonna need everyone's help, and if you don't participate, I'm a C. So I need everyone to start clapping like this. Yeah, okay. You can stop now. <laughs> oh, okay. You can stop now. <laughs> so what does it really mean for every part to play a part that only that part can play? Here's the thing. I think sometimes in our society, artists and individuals are kind of lifted up as kind of the, the, the catalysts and advocates for a certain kind of thing, right? But I think this can, certain kind of thing can get us in trouble because why this gets us in trouble is because it starts to tokenize heroism. So what I'm going to talk about today is a place to call home. I just kind of put a lot of images in a folder and I'm just gonna be sharing those images with you. They mean a lot to me. They've kind of been the images that I've used for my career. And uh, we're just gonna talk about roots. We're gonna talk about principles. We're gonna talk about values today. Sound good? 
The first principle that I want to share with you guys today is you have to know the rules to break the rules. Now, uh, who has heard that before? Okay, almost everyone. There's a reason why. I learned that from Greg Patecki, who is actually my high school art teacher. It's one of the first things that we teach in art. It's a very common principle. And I didn't believe it at first because my favorite artists, um, I didn't really see them as breaking rules as much as it was reframing a narrative or reframing a space, right? So my favorite artist always kind of looked at a scenario and they flipped it on its head. And it's not that anyone said that they couldn't do it, it's just that uh, no one did it before, right? So this thing that might be kind of illegal, no one really said it was explicitly illegal. And that's kind of how I work in my life. So I'm gonna read a poem to you real quick. It's not very good. Actually, I don't really know what constitutes a good poem these days, to be real with you. Unsanctioned rhythm, that thumper kind of love, roots of a heartbeat, ballad of the joyful. The British is coming, mama losing house. Things just ain't been the same since the Starbucks came. We gonna play with MCA because they don't left plenty of walls. So when I wrote this, I wrote this kind of as a, as a manifesto for a project that I called Echoes and Whispers. So I think it was, I don't know, I'm not great with time. So um, I don't know, like five, six, seven, maybe 10 years ago, a long time ago to me, there was um, a lot of protests happening in my community. So to be clear of where I'm from, first and foremost, um, I'm from the west side of Chicago. And I think that means a lot if you live in Chicago, right? Because Chicago is 77 communities, and uh, everyone can get a little iffy about what side of town you're from. And in particular, where I kind of was hanging out 10 years ago was the south side of Chicago, right? 71st and Yates more in particular, because I, I actually worked on Stony. And people would always come up to me like, yo, you talk kind of funny. Like, where are you from? And I'd always say, like, I'm from the west side. They're like, nah, you're not from the west side. You know what I mean? Like, where are you from? I'm like, nah, I, I'm, I'm actually from the west side. There's a lot in there, though, right? Like, I was born in Oak Park. I was raised in Austin. Went to high school at HF. It's 11-11, perfect. <laughs> with, that, with that being said, um, for me, art started to get a little dull about 10 years ago. I was going to a lot of shows because at the time it was my job to go to shows. I never really went to college. Um, I tried, I, I did a semester at Prairie State. I came over here to beat you guys at COD with, uh, uh, I was in speech class and I beat you guys pretty bad. Um, you know, I'm a legend. And uh, you know, I, I just realized it just wasn't challenging and so I actually left college and I, I wanted to be an artist, but I didn't know what path I was actually going to be on, right? Like that old atelier system no longer exists in which you would go under another artist, train under them for a long period of time and be in their studio. Um, and they still kind of do this, right? Like if you work for Jeff Koons, most likely you're pretty dope and you're gonna have your own dope career. But it's like, how do I get Jeff Koons email at the end of the day, right? And at the same time, how do I pay my rent? That's the most important question when you live in Chicago. And so for me, I took a job at first at Subway, uh, then I actually ended up helping out one of my friends. My friend was a filmmaker at Columbia University. And I thought that was funny, because like, you know, all the shorties, whatever, was like, oh, damn, he, you know, he, he's super great with the films, la, la, la. And I'm like, he ain't all that great with the films. Like, let, let, let's go head to head. On, on directors, let's go head to head on actors, let's go head to head on film movements, and let's really see what you got going on. And he was really phenomenal, he had really great knowledge. But I think after that conversation, what we created was a mutual respect, right? So when he started to do his documentary film, I was the first person he thought of to be assistant director uh, on the East Coast. And so I went with him with a team of other really great people, one of which I work with today, and uh, we made a film. We shot in New York, we shot in Baltimore, we shot in Philly, uh, we went to Washington, D.C. And this film was really about the generation, the, the generation Y. 
and we called it Why Not, right? In a sense that we felt like there was information that the last generation had that we weren't given. And what was this disconnect? Because there was a little bit of resentment for the older generation looking on the younger generation. And for the younger generation, there was a little bit of like uh, disinvestment from the older generation. Like you guys gave us a bad hand at the end of the day, right? So with that being said, film became my medium. I started to love more and more films. I worked on a whole bunch of film sets when I came back to Chicago. Um, then I, when, when the film sets weren't paying enough and when writing about art wasn't paying enough, I didn't really know what to do. Right? It was my job to go to show to show and to write about the artist, to write about the work, uh, then to upload it to a magazine or send another intern to a show or whatever. And what I realized is that this is boring. We're going, you know, white space to white space, drinking red wine, eating some crackers like it's communion. And uh, <laughs> it, it was like, yo, what's the point of this, right? Because this, this, this culture on the wall is supposed to be reflective of the world that we live in, yet it's not because it, it's stationary. And so there's, there's a way in which I can look at something, because I love art, because I love images, and I can derive meaning from it, but this thing called Instagram, there's images every couple seconds, right? Like every two seconds. And so my attention span has actually decreased. Nationally, our attention span looking at a piece of work would used to be an hour and a half. Then it went down to 40 minutes. Today, modern times, it's about five seconds. Uh, so most people look at a piece of work, they analyze it, and they move on. Now, this, there's good and bad in that, right? The good part about it is that people today, because we're exposed to so much, we have a higher visual literacy, meaning that we can derive images, uh, the symbols in the images, a lot faster. Uh, the bad part <laughs> is that you, you could be working for like nine months on a photograph, and then someone looks at it for five seconds. It's like, dang, fam, like, I really cared about that photograph. And so for me, what I realized is that the people in my community who probably, not even probably, it was, it was just the truth. If I asked people in my community on the South Side, hey, what do you think about the Bajas movement? What do you think about Black Mountain? What do you, what do you think about uh, pop art? they actually didn't know these art movements, right? And so something I really cared about, I couldn't share with my neighbors. I couldn't share with the people that meant the most to me. And so it's like, okay, cool, let me, let me do an art show. And so I prepared to do this art show. There was this gallery that really wanted to work with me and they wanted my work to be in the gallery, la la la. And I was like, yeah, I don't think I'm gonna do that though. I think it's a little bit more exciting if I take the, my, my work from your walls and I just put them on abandoned spaces in my community and let's just see what happens. And so that's what we did. I, I, I grabbed a group of musicians that I really believed in and it's like, yo, let's make this like a New Orleans funeral. You know what I'm saying? Let's go door to door and let's activate these spaces because these spaces, these buildings, they're abandoned, they're dead. So how do we make them alive again? And so we started pasting these images, these, these uh, works of art of mine on the walls, and it was really encouraging to see neighbors come up and you know, th they started dancing, they started singing in the chorus, they started clapping just like you guys, adding their own selves to the work, to the art. And I realized this is the kind of practice, a living kind of practice that meant the most to me, right? Because it's no longer about the, the individualized kind of like, oh, look what I did that's on the wall, it's really cool. It's like actually, as a community, how could we like make things happen and at the same time look at like something that's ridiculous, like abandoned space. This is one of my, uh, one of my neighbors, Damari, and uh, this is one of my early works. It was a, it was a portrait of him, but uh, Damari actually was uh, a victim of child abuse and I actually would hear him being abused next door over. And um, I really didn't know what to do, right? Um, and so we would just talk after, after, after work, I'd be home and he'd be in the hallway and I'd come out in the hallway. We'd have these like 30 minute conversations and I would try to talk to his parents, but it's like the work that I'm doing isn't reaching Damari, right? Like at the end of the day, he's going through something real. He's, he's, he's got some real challenges happening in his family. 
and the work needs to be nourishing. It needs to be a safe space. So how can I provide a safe space for Damari? And I've been thinking about that ever since. This is the city of Chicago. Um, specifically, where I work and where I live is Austin, Chicago. So I don't know if you guys know much about Austin, Chicago, but it's the largest community in Chicago. Some people are gonna say that's Inglewood. They lying. It's close. Inglewood's five miles, Austin's like seven, right? So it's close, but it's actually Austin. The thing about Austin is that there's 5,000, approximately 5,000 abandoned spaces in my community. My community also happens to be predominantly black and brown. I think that's really important to say. Do you guys see that red X? What, what do you guys think that means? Just shout out some answers. Infestation, that's a good, that's a good answer. What else? What's up? Treasury. Treasury. I love that. <laughs> uh, I actually really, really love that. Um, but that's, that's a, no. Uh, any other answers? Yes. Cool. The fire department has a policy to actually put these red X's on abandoned spaces that are condemned, right? It's a signifier that this space is condemned. It's another signifier to the firehouse that if this building is on fire, to let it burn. So imagine living next to a property that is deemed condemned, and if it's on fire, they're gonna let it burn. What the kind of insecurity that might create as a homeowner for yourself and for, for your neighbors, how that makes them feel. Because you don't see this red X on every house and every community, right? Like, there's only a few communities you would see a red X, and we identified those spaces to be the south and the west sides of Chicago. So this is what I mean by breaking the rules. So one of the people that I met on my trip to New York, his name is uh, Jordan Campbell. And Jordan Campbell is just like one of them like real people. You know what I'm saying? That's my, that's my homie, that's my best friend. At the time, he was dating this shorty who was like, like one of the finest girls I had ever seen, you know what I'm saying? So I was like, I'm like how, who is this dude? You know what I mean? Like, how, how he get her? Uh, but Jordan's super cool. Uh, Jordan was one of those guys who would like wake up with a playlist, listening to John Coltrane, Love Supreme, or Maxwell, Pretty Wings, right? He'd have his shy tea latte going, you know? He, he'd be editing images at the same time. And Jordan was the cinematographer on this film trip. He really knew light and how to engage light. And so me and Jordan kind of had this same ethos, understanding that art for our community needed to do just a little bit more than look pretty. And so it's like, how do we create safe spaces? How do we engage with our neighbors, right? Fast forward to 2020. Uh, George Floyd was murdered. Breonna Taylor is murdered. Black and brown bodies are being murdered left and right. This is nothing new, to be clear. To be clear, this is nothing new. It's echoes of Emmett Till. At the end of the day, though, it's highly politicized, and, and there's no punishment for those who are murdering us, right? And so in our community, there became a lot of looting that started to happen. So to be clear, we live in a food apartheid, meaning that there are no fresh grocery stores around our radius. You'd have to go to Oak Park, the neighboring community, to get like a pizza or a jewel or something like that. And so what we had was like family dollar. And there's some food and family dollar in the back in the fridge. And that family dollar's looted. And so it's like, what do you do when the family dollar's looted, your community's hurting, COVID-19's happened, right? So I'm like, I'm terrified to leave my house, but a lot of my older neighbors who have trouble with their knees and they, they, they can't be Ubering everywhere, right? They can't do Uber Eats, they, they're struggling. Where do they eat? How do they get fresh groceries? And so we thought about this for a long period of time. And in 2020, we did something called Faith in Action, right? So we started a nonprofit in 2019, and uh, we, didn't, we didn't really know many people. We didn't have much. We still worked our nine to fives, but what we did have was faith. What Altspace is, is the intersection between faith, art, and community. And we think about that a lot, faith, art, and community, because we actually think that where some people try to separate those terms, 
there's actually more in common than they have in difference, right? And so what we did was we took to Instagram, to be real with you. We took to Instagram. We were like, hey, guys, our neighbors are struggling. Here's Miss Shirley. Miss Shirley's having trouble getting groceries. Can you guys donate to this page, this cash app, whatever, and we're going to get groceries for everybody, right? So in 2019, we had 100 volunteers that came from this Instagram post. We sent 50 to the south side, and we sent 50 to the west side. So the 50 on the west side were with me at Austin Town Hall. The 50 that were with Jordan, my business partner, was on uh, 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 Jeffrey. And we gave out 500 care packages. And these care packages had like women products, they had food, they had water, they had resource tabs as well. But we, what we realized, as, and it was an adrenaline high, I'm not gonna lie too, just like meeting neighbors, being able to help, being able to meet the need, right? It felt really, really good until you realize that you need to do it again tomorrow, right? And so it's like, okay, cool, this thing that felt kind of good and was instinctual and people were getting fed, you realize, hey man, they, they actually, there's, they don't have resources like next week. Like, and we can't keep doing this, it's actually unsustainable. And so what can we do to not actually just start giving stuff out, right? Like giveaways are cool, but giveaways are not sustainable. What can we actually do? So we actually looked to the abandoned buildings in our community and we were like, hey, this abandoned building actually can be like a store, like a free store, you know what I'm saying? Kind of like the free libraries that you have in your communities. And so it's like, yo, let's just adapt that joint. And so we like grabbed a few of our friends in our faith community and we built this thing, like we reclaimed the wood ourselves and we call it the alt space market where, you know, neighbors can come and put their resources and other neighbors can come and take those resources. So what we thought about was trying to make a communal economy. How can we reframe what the economy looks like, right? Because the, the motive is not to just give away free things. The motive is to reframe the narrative for neighbors, how we engage with other neighbors. If I need some sugar and you got some flour, can we trade? Can we actually create a space where neighbors could talk? And that's exactly what happened. But other things started happening too. What you'll see right here is actually us building the market with neighborhood kids and with our friends. What we realized after the first market, it kind of blew up past our control. We had no idea it was gonna blow up so much. And then a whole bunch of other communities started asking for one. So this is one that we built in Greater Grand Crossing um, along with an organization I used to work for called Rebuild Foundation with my uh, colleague, Theasha Gates. And uh, that's Jordan right next to me on this picture right here. We actually worked with uh, St. Alfred and Nike. Also, they, Nike was like, hey, how can we get involved, right? And so at first they were just like putting free shoes out on the, on the markets. And that was, that's, that's, that's cool, that's cool. But how could we get involved a little bit deeper than a giveaway? I wanted to share with you guys how impact can kind of move. After we did the first market, we started seeing markets pop up all over the nation, right? And what was really cool was a lot of organizations started calling us. So this one is actually in Inglewood, California. Um, there was an actress, her name was Zoe Lee, and the actress had seen what we were doing because uh, the director, Ava DuVernay, really likes the alt space market on the south side, right? So she started sharing about it. And uh, Zoe Lee was like, hey, I wanna build one for my community in Inglewood. Can you guys help me? Can you guys like walk me through it? And so we got on the phone, we walked him through it, but then, I don't know, like it, it, it didn't feel right. I'm like, oh, I kinda, I kinda need to see this. You know what I'm saying? I kinda need to like be there and feel that energy. And so we got on the plane and we moved out there. We said, hey, what, what's good? And it was really, really cool because as we were checking out this market in Inglewood, there was a gentleman in a wheelchair who like rolled up, he was using the market. And as we started engaging with him and talking with him, it turns out he actually originally was from Chicago. So it's kind of cool how these through lines keep happening in the practice, right? But you start realizing that this one idea that you had of just trying to inspire neighbors to share with one another can inspire other neighbors to share the same practice. Right, and so it became a functional installation as we like to call it. Putting this thing together, I was like, I wanna share stuff I've never shared with people before. And so there's a whole bunch of like insider company information that like I, I poured in and so I hope you enjoy. This was actually sent to us by Nike Chicago and they were like, hey, we actually wanna get involved 
deeper. How could we kind of, uh, like, they, they, what they were really interested in was getting people out to vote. Uh, we had another president in the, in the office, and they were like, okay, cool, how can we get more and more people to vote? Like, that's, that's the goal. There's a lot of voter suppression happening. And so we were like, okay, cool, well, you, that's, that's your motive. That's your intentionality, and we definitely want to help out with that. But we also realized that within our community, 40% of our people actually don't have regular access to the internet, right? Um, it's like, you know, it is what it is. It's expensive. And... The, the Wi-Fi centers that we would go to, whether it was the library or the McDonald's, they're not really allowing people to sit down and chill anymore. And so how can we kind of create a Wi-Fi center? And so we looked at the market and we were like, it'd be really cool if that when you walk past this thing, you got like a notification and like you got Wi-Fi. You know what I'm saying? And you could like use it at the market. We were like, oh man, that's super dope, that's super dope. Until uh, Nike's lawyers got on the horn and they were like, uh, real quick question, um, we didn't ask, do you own this building? <laughs> and we're like, nah, we don't, we, don't know, we don't own any of this, right? And again, this is what I mean by sometimes you need to know the rules before breaking the rules. Um, technically, what we do is kind of illegal because we don't own this space. But what we tried originally to do was get permission. We reached out, like, hey, who owns this building? What you realize on a lot of these properties is that Ownership is a little tenuous, right? In the sense of like a company owns a company, owns another company, and they actually have the ownership under their name, right? So kind of trying to track down these owners, you talk to a lot of people who live in Florida or Arizona. Um, so yeah, okay, cool. How can we adapt? Since we don't really own the space, how can we adapt the, the space? Nike actually came up with the idea of like, hey, what about a truck? Would that work? Can we do a truck? We were like, absolutely, we can do a truck. Can we design it? And so we designed this truck together. And the point was to go from site to site, registering people to vote, at the same time giving people sports equipment so they could work out on their own, at the same time just creating community. So can we put like a DJ in there? And uh, you know, that's me and Jordan DJing in there and giving out stuff on, on the west side specifically, right? So how can this idea continue to transform and continue to inspire, continue to create change? The second principle is copy-paste. I think that's an easy one to remember. Uh, control C, Control V. <laughs> I put this to paper a wall, right? Like uh, sometimes graffiti to me is like wallpaper, uh, just because it's not good. You know what I'm saying? It's just like pattern over pattern over pattern. And I, and I think, yo, how can we actually like make good art, right? Like art that actually invokes emotion, but at the same time, how can we actually make public space a little bit more public? So this is, a, a, again, another one of those ideas that isn't strictly legal. It's just us doing stuff. So um, in 2019, we started a series of photo shoots in our community. Here's the thing. We want to build a building in Austin for our, our nonprofit. But we realized something very clearly from listening to Oprah. So Oprah said in an interview long, long time ago that she tried a program on the west side of Chicago, and it didn't work. It failed. And we're like, OK, why did it fail? And she said, well, the, th the thing is, you have to change how people feel about themselves, right? Because if people don't change how they feel about themselves, what you have is broken windows at your, at your space, you know? And because they're like, who, who built this and who is it for, right? Intentionality is very important when you're building in public space, when you're building in community. And so before we build a space, how about we actually try to change how neighbors feel about themselves? Here's, here's the reality. If, if you guys, any one of you guys walk on the west side of Chicago, there might be a temptation to, fe to feel unsafe, right? Typically, we treat spaces how we treat people. And sometimes we can feel a little bit unsafe when the spaces that we're in are not kept up with, right? When there's a lot of broken glass, where there's a lot of trash on the ground, uh, when there's people walking around who are in poverty, we can feel a little unsafe. We feel how you feel. You know what I'm saying? We be on our streets and we feel the same way, unsafe. And so it's like, how can we create safe spaces in our own neighborhoods? So we invited all of our neighbors to come for these public photo shoots. Like, hey, we'd really love to take your image. Can, we, can, we, can you please come over and, and we got some food. We get, actually got the DJ going. You know, we got some nice music. And it was a really cool time because like within three days, we took 
over 100 images of families. Oh, I'm sorry. It was like over 5,000 images. It was over 100 families came out within these three days in these three spots in Austin just to have their photograph taken. And what we realized recently is that this is the first public archive that has been created since the 90s. And so we actually got a $10,000 grant with a diamond in the back, uh, the Blacktivist, to be able to create the first archive of the west side of Chicago. Um, that being said, oh, the top picture is, uh, we were in L LA and like there's an abandoned building, so we're like, why not, right? So we printed one of those images and brought a little bit of LA to Chicago, um, which was really cool because a protest was happening at the same time that we didn't know about, and when they saw us doing what we were doing, they're like, hey! What was really cool is that we've done this project over and over and over and over and over again. We call it Project Stamp, because what, and I should kind of back it up. What we do after these, we take the images of our neighbors is we ask their permission. Can we use this on abandoned spaces? And what we've had is 100% yes. Go ahead and use that image. And so we give them a physical copy of their image, right? Because we kind of have this thing about tangibles. Like that's something that we had in the 90s with Santa Claus is that we had this like little tangible thing, this little tangible piece of history. And so we like to give those tangible pieces of history. But at the same time, there's all these abandoned buildings. So if I put in a, a image of a neighbor on an abandoned space, it's less scary. Now it's more familiar. And that was the point, that if we stamp our images in our own community, that it starts to feel a little bit more familiar, right? So instead of seeing abandonment, instead of seeing disinvestment, you'd see your neighbors, you'd see your homies, you'd see your friends, you'd see you know, your family members, your, your mailman. That's really, really important to us. Another artist had saw that work on the walls and he was like, yo, that is so dope. And he started drawing them, like just in his sketchbook. And we thought the work was super cool. Like, yo man, you made a drawing of a photograph of a neighbor? That's so dope. I love how it just keeps iterating, right? So we made a t-shirt of a drawing of a photograph of a neighbor. Uh, and we call it the drop. And um, what was really cool is that we actually really believe in our environment. We believe if we don't make some heavy changes in our environment and the way we consume things, we might be even more in trouble soon. And so these are overstock t-shirts, meaning that these are t-shirts that we're gonna get thrown away. Um, they're a little bit bigger. And so it's like, how can we continue to invest in our environment? Every sale of this t-shirt provided us money to be able to hire a community member to do a job for us. This is another iteration. So St. Ambrose University saw what we were doing, and in 2021, they're like, hey, why don't you guys come and do like an exhibition? We'll give you $20,000. And like, cool, uh, that's cool money. Can I use some of that money though to like hire some of the neighbors that are interested in art? and like I can teach them how to do the wheat pasting so I don't have to come back here. Not that I would not come back here. I love Davenport, Iowa. It's super, it's super, it's not what you think. It's great. Um, it's like one of those spots people don't typically want a vacation at, but like Davenport, Iowa has really incredible neighbors, really great people. And so that's what we wanted to show people is that the neighbors here matter, that they do incredible things, so we did another public photo shoot in Davenport so that the neighbors would be able to see each other. Third principle, don't react, respond. There is a subtle difference between reacting some to something and responding to something. This is Jerome. When a presidential election had terrified me personally, I didn't really know how to respond, right? I and I think the reaction part is like, I wanna hop on Twitter, I wanna hop on Facebook, I wanna you know, spit my views out, you know, I wanna get in an argument with my uncle, all that kind of stuff. Um, but then I thought about it a little bit more. So that bottom long image right here with Starlotta is from one of my first exhibitions called Black Rivers Steal Away. This show was largely based on a Du Bois quote, W.E.B. Du Bois, about the double consciousness in America, living you know, as a person of color. And uh, as you see, there's this tape doll that I had hung, and his name was Jerome. It's a very kind of jarring image. That night, me and Jordan got on Romello's shoulders, and we cut down Jerome 
and we walk Jerome out with dignity together, right? Something that we wish we could have done for some of our cousins and friends in the past. Jerome had been sitting in my closet for like a long period of time, like an unhealthy amount of, he's still in my closet to be honest with you. Um, I had no idea what to do with Jerome. Uh, some people wanted to use him at parties. Some people wanted to have a campfire and like burn him. I'm like, nah, that's not happening. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And so it's like, okay, cool. Like there's a black body in my closet. Um, and it's a little awkward. I don't really know what to do with it, right? So there's, after this election, I had a lot of emotions. I didn't really know what to do. So it's like, I went to church. And what I realized that my church is that they were like, hey, let's, let's open the book of, of Ruth. And they did like a random sermon on the book of Ruth. I'm like, yo, is there, is there something else we should probably be talking about? Like, is there something a little bit more urgent we could like mention? I don't know. Like, and I, I kept feeling Sunday after Sunday that things were not being said. Things were not being addressed. And so I had no idea how to get this angst out. So I walked Jerome in my community. I walked him around, and then I went to another community, and I walked Jerome in that community. I just wanted to see how people would respond to the black body. Then I took him to the MCA, and this is the picture here. Uh, <laughs> um, most people were shocked, and actually, to actually go up the stairs, they made me check him into the coat check, which I thought was hilarious. Um, but I just felt like it was cool because there are people in my community that didn't need an explanation, right? Some people needed a, a long-winded explanation. But there's some people who just got it, and they came up and dapped me, and I thought that was a really cool moment that they just understood what I was trying to say. Uh, this is one of those kind of failure meets uh, success moments. So this picture right here of this temple um, is something I'm really interested in. I'm really interested in sacred space and public space. And um, this is a sacred space moment that I wanted to create in Davenport, Iowa. And, I, I, and here's the thing about public work, again, you have to get the buy-in of the neighbors. So I was doing my best salesman, like, yeah, what we want to do is we want la, 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 la. So here's the thing. It's called the city of bridges. There's a lot of bridges in Davenport, Iowa. So I wanted to create these three kind of sacred spaces where inside there's a curated collection from the neighbors so that when you'd walk into this space, you'd see other things that your neighbors were into. You'd see the archives of your neighbors, a shared collective history. The neighbors were not about that life. They were like, no thank you, what else you got? And I was like, okay. And so we went to pictures, right? Like, how about we do Project Stamp? And they were like, yeah, that sounds great. So we did Project Stamp. But I can't let things go if it's like in my head. I have to like iterate it somehow. And so we were invited to the uh, Terrain Biennial last year. And I was like, hey, can we do this in Terrain Biennial? And hey, can we do this in like five days? So what we did was we hired a neighbor and we uh, just worked and we, we uh, got a whole bunch of pallets. We have a partnership with a pallet company. And we created this space in which when you walk in, you could play films, you could have, hang out, you could like exchange things with your neighbors, we could tell stories. It's a sacred space. It looks a lot different than the pyramid. I wanted it to look like a pyramid, but this actually looks a little bit cooler to me because it's plexi and I like plexi. Anyway, this is a moment in which we just wanted to encourage our neighbors. We saw like an empty space. And so we got some friends out, it was really hot outside, and we just created this larger project stamp, right? Trying to remind people that they're the light of the world that they actually have hope within them, right? I'm not trying to sell you anything. We just want to inspire you with an image from our community. This is one of those interesting moments that I have no idea sometimes what we do at Altspace, right? So Altspace Chicago, our nonprofit, is artist-led, faith-driven, and sometimes people come up to us with very interesting projects. There's another nonprofit called 360 Nation that's also based on the west side, specifically in Lawndale. And they're gangster like us, you know what I'm saying? Like they saw like an abandoned lot and they decided to take that over. They started building uh, uh, raised beds for a community garden. They started doing free programming and aquaponics. And we just thought that was super cool. But what they didn't have was a shelter from the rain. What they didn't have was a space in which community t could actually come together, make meals, sell things, talk about those things. And so what we started doing on our plane back to Chicago from LA was designing a pergola. I had no idea what a pergola was. Um, like, 
this guy kept saying, we want to build a pergola, we want to build a pergola. I'm like, what is a pergola? Anyway, we built a pergola. The roof is put on a 45 degree angle so that it catches rainwater for that community garden. And this is what it looks like. We hired a team of neighbors to you know, come and help us. We had to first like plow the land, make sure it was nice and level. We had to dig in the land to get the concrete in there, then put these poles in there, and then from there we can kind of create the roof. Fourth principle, sustainability for us is just love over time. I think a lot of nonprofits stress about what is sustainability. You, you see it in mission statements, you see it in operational manuals. Um, you hear it, it's very popular to say for artists as well. Sustainability, sustainability, is it sustainable, blah, 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 blah. For us, it's very simple. It's just loving something over time. I care about this thing, I want it to do well, and I, and I care to make things happen continuously. So this is a moment when the Bulls came out to help us care for our community. Um, that's actually uh, Patrick Williams, who plays for the Chicago Bulls, and Erica Bauer, who is an uh, amazing administrator. And um, he just wanted to help. So it's like, hey man, you can come at any time. You know what I'm saying? The Alt Space Market is a couple doors down from our studio. And he came by and he helped us. And, and he's been helping ever since. It's been really great. And this is the last thing I'll show you. This is kind of top secret, right? So nobody really knows about this. I haven't posted about it. I've been really lax on Instagram lately. Like I've been trying, but sometimes when you've got like 10 projects, it feels like Instagram is like the last thing you should be doing, right? So it's like, I don't, I don't have time to put this on the posting schedule. At the same time, what, what Instagram is, is the communication tool, right? It's just one of those outlets. It's, it's one of those things in which you're able to engage a large period of audience, a, lar a lar large scale of people continuously, right? And whether they like the, the sponsor or, or share it or save it or not, the information is out there. And we like that kind of open source. Anyway, what this is based on is that what we realize that the first sign of disinvestment in any community is trash. So what we started doing is cleaning up trash in 2019. We call it Sunday service because we did some research because um, how we work as an organization is that we do a needs-based analysis Meaning, we do our research, we do our homework before we do any activating. Um, and so what we realized is that in the 2019 police reports is that Sunday in our community was the highest day for gun violence. And so knowing that, we wanted to be a public deterrent to that gun violence and at the same time clean up our community. So we asked our friends to come out and clean with us. And uh, we've been doing that every Sunday since. But we realized it was unsustainable, that word again. Right, like how do we continue to do love over time, but like at the end of the day, I clean up on Sunday, it's dirty again on Wednesday. I know we're not dirty or, you know, as a, as a community, I know we're not like, you know, dirty or, 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 or trifling. How do we fix this problem? And you start realizing the, the roots of that problem, right? For instance, I'd go to Oak Park, a community I love, a community I was born in. There's a garbage bin on every corner. Boom, 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 boom. Makes sense. I go to Austin. Where are the garbage bins at? There are none, right? You have to go to the dumpsters in the alley. That's why there's trash. There's actually a solution to these little problems. There's actually a very simple solution to these little problems. So we started building garbage bins. And now we have a contract with the city of Chicago to empty those bins. Um, but we wanted to take it a step further this year. So one thing I haven't told people about that you guys are getting the inside track on is plastic is destroying our world. Plastic was meant to never be destroyed, ever. Like this was like the impossible material. The thing that's kind of hubris though is that we use it in single serving objects. Like, uh, hold on, like this. Like you're only supposed to use this like once or twice, right? Um, why is this made out of plastic? Why isn't this made out of like anything else ever, right? And so we started realizing that plastic in our community can actually be put together in different ways. And so what we started doing is melting that plastic down and building public benches with that the plastic. And what we call it is redeeming plastics, right? Because we think that there is a great redemption that needs to happen, not only with our spaces, but with our people. Um,
With that being said, I think we can do questions. I think I'm done. Thank you so much for listening. In regards to you were just talking about like how you're going down the plastic, like that process, do you have a way to like capture some of the vapors that are being released from the plastic so that that also doesn't like poison your cells or poison other people in the area, perhaps pollution in the air? I think it's really interesting and I've seen other people do this before with them being plastic, but I just don't know the process. So if you could elaborate on that just a little bit. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you so much. What a, what a thoughtful question, first and foremost. What a thoughtful question, first and foremost. Thank you so much. That, that, is a, um, that is a big question. So here's how we do with redeeming plastics. First and foremost, what we're trying to do is get a cohort of neighbors to be in training, right? So we're gonna be paying interns, and interns can be whatever ages, right? Just neighbors. Paying neighbors to collect plastics in our neighborhood, right? So you're actually getting paid to do the work of what we usually do every day, right? Which was clean up, clean up after ourselves and clean up after others who actually, you know, dampen our community. From there, we shred the plastic, right? So we have this big old shredder machine and it turns into these little itty bitty bits, right? And from those little bit itty bitty bits, what we do is we put them in the extruder and the extruder kind of gels out the, the melted plastics together. Now, we actually haven't figured out the vapor problem. We have a giant kind of like oven that kind of helps contain the vapor, and then we also have masks, but we actually haven't figured out how to stop it from getting into the environment itself. So it's a very flawed system, but we're still committed to trying to figure out how, to, how do we reduce our, our, our carbon footprint. Can you like pay your rent by doing this full time? Like, do you do it full time? Do you have to support yourself in other ways? Yeah, yeah, I didn't go into my staff, but um, so I'm full time Alt Space Chicago slash artist. Uh, so is my business partner, Jordan Campbell. Uh, then we hired a COO. Uh, her name is Dr. Curry Green, um, and she writes grants. Uh, then we hired recently, her name is Alexandria Oregbu. She's an artist. She's also a, um, a professor at SAIC, and she does, she's an assistant director of education. I never talked about our educational programs, but we have educational programs. We're starting a school, so th there's that. She's running that. Um, it's tough, I'll say this. A lot of organizations are kind of opposed to working with uh, corporations, and I get it, I understand it. Uh, but I think for us, for the future, there has to be a, a public and private partnerships that need to be formed that are value-based, right? Like how can we mess with people who, have, who share our values, right? And so at the end of the day, our, our financial system works like this. There's the grants that we write and work really hard for. Uh, then there's our partnerships with companies, right? Like Nike or Jones Soda or Chicago Bulls, whatever. Uh, then over here um, is moments like this where you know, we do talks or educational things for other schools um, where we, we do e exhibitions and those exhibitions pay us money and we give that money to the, uh, the nonprofit. So. Um, for now, it's paying us, but, you know, things change. Uh, <laughs> I love the idea that you reclaim the, the open, abandoned spaces, and you build a pergola. But my question is about gentrification and redlining. How does that affect you? Deeply. Um, so, I left uh, the south side of Chicago uh, 10 years ago or so, with a lot of questions about redlining and gentrification. So gentrification is a big word. What it really comes down to is displacement. How can my neighbor who's had this house for 40 years continue to live here when all of a sudden there's new neighbors who are here and she can't afford uh, either the property taxes that goes up or the stores that live in her community no longer represent her? How can we continue to keep this community like that? It's a constant battle, I think that one of the things that we've analyzed is that there is a relationship. Um, people will say otherwise, but I'm telling you the truth. There is a relationship between artists and gentrification because artists will be in communities, they'll start activating spaces, then all of a sudden people start buying houses. I'll also say this. The people that owned houses on the west side of Chicago weren't us anyway, for the most part, for the majority. 
um, I think the number was two thirds of homeowners lost their homes since 2014 in Austin. Um, uh, there's a lack of jobs in our community. And so I think the first solution for us is providing jobs, high value jobs. Uh, that's one of the things that we do. And then the other part is uh, vulnerability. So what we've been doing at our studio is we host a lot of neighbors to come to our studio. We talk about finances. We talk about how, how if anyone's in trouble, how can we kind of have a lending system? So we have like a community investment bank and how can some of that money from the community investment bank help protect a neighbor from having a lien incurred on their home? Uh, that's actually one of the works that we're doing on Chicago Avenue. There's a house called the Lotus House. It's potentially the oldest house in Austin, Chicago. Um, yet it needs a lot of redevelopment. And so we've had to advocate with the aldermen. We've had to make coalitions of neighbors who are fighting for this project to continue. Um, but it's, it, it's a continual battle. One of the things that I would list as a resource for anybody if you want to protect from gentrification is uh, putting, a, a land, putting your land into a land trust. Um, that way that uh, it's always protected and that land trust can be owned by a nonprofit. And so they can't lose the property. My friend, what's up? Um, <laughs> I really admire the work you and your partners are doing. And um, very blown away by your presentation today. Sherry and I do a lot of community work as well. How do you get corporate bodies? How do you get corporate sponsorship? Our problem is, is we can't we can't get um, people aligned with that's a great question. Um, so that's a hard question for me. And, and the hardness comes from we've never approached anybody. They've, they've approached us. But the, here, here's what I would say. Artists, what we do really well is we make things sexy, right? Um, like if you can't make things sexy, if you can't make things hot, you know what I'm saying? I don't know, you know? So that's what we do. We understand uh, mood, we understand vibe, we understand framing, we understand light, we understand shape. And so what we worked really hard doing, me and my business partner, we, we drove around Austin. And I'd, see, I'd say, hey, you see that? That's a community run organization. Hey, you see that? That's a neighbor run daycare. I don't want us to ever look like that because it looks like a neighbor run space. You know what I'm saying? I don't want it to have that, that feel to it. How can we kind of take these high art ideals and these high art objects and translate them, not only to be easily digested by our neighbors, but at the same time respected in the art field. And so uh, the alt space market, for instance, is made out of wood and plexi. That's something that we understand as a community. Um, it's something that it's, it's, it's seen often. But the way in which we cared for it, the way in which we presented it, the way in which we framed it made the art world like, ooh, you know what I'm saying? What's that? You know, like, because it's an art, because we framed it not as like a, a communal space. We framed it as an art object, right? Um, so I'd say the framing will put the corporations around you. Mm -hmm.